ladies and gentlemen, Cheryl Sandberg, Lori Golder, and Dylan McGee. Thanks, you both, for being here. I think this is going to look, if I sit back, my feet don't touch the ground. <laughs> So I think I'm going to sit on the edge here. And these are not the stools. The stools are boy chairs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes, the stools are for boys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you both, for being here. Um, Cheryl has been at every conference since we started. She was my very first Makers interview when she sat there and said, I leave work every day at 530 to get home to my kids. And that was incredible. And that gave other women permission to do that. And you have really been a true leader in the corporate space, fighting for equality for women long before many others have. And your recent um, commitment to women's health, we thank you so much for that. All right. But today, we're, talk, we're going to turn the conversation and we're going to talk about women in the workplace. And we have a room, in, a room filled with these women who are going to go back to their organizations and be bold and make change. And so we want to give you the tools in this session to be able to do that. Okay, so here we go. Um, the first question is, we named this session, I don't think it's written in any of the materials, but we know it, <laughs> um, The Future of Work, A Career Adventure. What does that mean? So my favorite career adventure story actually comes from Lori, who says all the time that careers are a jungle gym, not a ladder. And when I first got to Facebook, we knew each other socially through my husband, not, not particularly well. And I got this call from Lori. She was at eBay at the time in marketing. And she called and said, I think I want to apply to come work with you at Facebook. So I thought about calling and telling you all the things I'm good at and all the things I like doing. But I figure everyone's doing that. So I just want to know, what's your biggest problem? And can I solve it? <laughs> Oh. Right? And I said, well, my biggest problem is recruiting, and you can solve it. And Lori jumped on to run recruiting, took her marketing skills, both marketing us as a company and our operational skills, running a marketing department, and ran, ran recruiting and then, and then people. But it was such a good example of how careers, the path is not just looking up and down traditionally, it's looking around. So let's hear it for Lori Goller. <laughs> You know, Lori, um, we have talked over the past three Makers Conference a lot about millennials and yeah. how that's kind of evolved. And every year I feel like it's a different conversation. So what is the 27, 2017 millennial sure. looking for? Sure. Well, millennials hold themselves to a very high bar and they hold their workplaces to a very high bar mm -hmm. and they aren't afraid to ask for what they want. So they're looking for fulfillment. They're looking for authenticity from leaders and from colleagues. They want to play to their strengths. They want to have impact, and they want to learn. And Mark Zuckerberg is actually the very best example of this, the first and only, still, millennial CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He is a learner, and he built a learning organization. And for those who follow his annual challenges, you'll know that he's learned Mandarin. A couple of years ago, he read so many books, I didn't even try to keep up with him. And, you know, I'd say, in terms of millennials, we're starting actually to think even about the next generation. The next generation is exciting What do we call now. them? The Generation Z. Zs. So many of us know them as our children. They were born after 1995. <laughs> we're also meeting them in the workplace as our interns. So they're sort of just starting to come into the workplace. And the interesting thing about Generation Z is that they've grown up in a time of personal feeds. So your Facebook feed, your Instagram mm -hmm. feed, they're all personalized to you. So I expect that when they come to the workplace, they will expect personalization. So we spend some time thinking about what it means to provide personalization at scale as part of your work experience. Right, great. I mean, moving from millennials now to women, it is a tough time for women in the workplace. What do we do? Easy question. I believe very, no, I believe very deeply that in women, I believe we have the ability to take great move, make great moves ourselves, lean in, fi find our ambition, find our confidence. I also believe that no woman can do it alone, that we have a responsibility to each other. And that responsibility goes through the federal level and the state level, in our communities, in our nonprofits, in our companies. And it is a challenging time. But any time there's a real challenge is not the time to retreat but the time to move forward. If you look at the history of lots of social change that's happened, there have always been moments where it looked really hard, and those are moments where we fight harder. We know what the policy agenda is for women. It's very clear. It is equal pay. We are still at 20% 20, 20 less than men, completely unacceptable. 
It's affordable child care. Child care is unaffordable for parents, especially single mothers in every state in our country. It is paid family and medical leave. And that means robust, comprehensive, 12 weeks, significant wage replacement covering not just childbirth, but other forms of becoming a family, other family needs. It's equal educational opportunities for women, right? We need better education in this country, let's be clear, for boys and girls. But we need to pay attention to our girls because they are behind in STEM, they are falling further behind in computer science, and those are many of the jobs of the future. And we owe our girls better. We owe that they get the same and as good educations in math and science and computer science. And importantly to me, it means more leadership for women because at the tables where decisions are made, from our elected officials to our town halls to our companies, we are still outnumbered. And that needs to change. So speaking of elected officials, I, I know someone who I think maybe should run for president. But um, anyway, <laughs> speaking of, um, you mentioned equal pay. It's definitely something that we all want to talk about here. Um, how do you think about that at Facebook? Equal pay is incredibly important to us at Facebook. Facebook has always been focused on equal pay. And since Cheryl and I arrived, we've been focused on equal pay as well. And at Facebook, men and women earn the same compensation for the same work. And it goes, yes, 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 yes. yes. And it goes well beyond even compensation to being sure that we're also looking at promotion data and assessment data through the performance review process. We wanna be sure that women are treated fairly throughout the entire process at every step of the way. And we are really proud to be leaders in equal pay and we look forward to a day when we don't even have to call that out. But how do we, how do, we do it? You know, I think it's up to companies to really take a stand and to be sure that they are doing what they need to do to get it done. And reviewing it comprehensively. Right. What Lori has led is a process of every review cycle, making sure men and women are getting promoted at fair rates, making sure there's not bias in the system, and also putting out what is very comprehensive, led by Lori, managing bias training that we've made public. Hear that, everybody? We all on board? <laughs> Equal pay? Yes? Good. What else? What other policies, in addition to equal pay, are at the top of your agenda at Facebook? Well, I'm really excited to talk about this in this audience because companies need to step up and lead. There is so much the amazing women in this audience representing some of the leading companies in the country can do. So parental leave has always been really important to Facebook, and this is pretty cool. Our parental leave, which is four months for women and men, one of the best in the United States, goes back before Laura and I arrived. Mark did this. He was a 20-ish, younger than 23-year-old single guy. And he put that in place because he really believed that fathers as well as mothers need to be with their kids. And then, very unusual for a CEO, he led by example when he had Max, you know, just a little bit over a year ago, he took parental leave himself. And that was, I think, really important. Last year, or sorry, May of 2015, we did something we think is really important, which is we took a hard look at our contractors. In this environment, more and more people are working as contract employees, and that means companies have responsibility to them too. We worked with the National Partnership for Women and Families. I think Vicki is Vicky's here somewhere. Vicki's here and speaking in the session. Okay, Vicki's coming next, but she, we were very influenced by Deborah Ness and Judy. Vicki Shaba is right there. Backstage. <laughs> well, we were very influenced by their work, and Deborah Ness and uh, Judy Lickstein, who lead that, were really influential in our thinking. And we rolled out for contractors who are doing substantial work for Facebook a $15 minimum wage. We rolled out paid time off so you could take vacation or sick leave, and importantly, financial coverage so that you could take paid parental leave. Again, companies really need to lead, and I think the reason we need to lead is not just because it's the right thing to do, even though it is. This is how we should be treating our employees and our contractors. It's the smart thing to do. When you treat your employees, your contractors, the people that work to fulfill your mission well, they become more dedicated to you. So this is right for the world, right for our employees, and right for every bottom line of the company that every woman in this audience works for. Well, and that's important. It really affects the bottom line. So you have a big announcement that you're going to make from the stage today. Do you want to share that with us? Sure. So we are actually expanding our leave policies. We are extending our bereavement policy, and we are including paid family leave as part of our benefits. We are really excited to share that here today. Our bereavement leave will be up to 20 days for those who lose a loved one in their immediate family. 
up to 10 days for those who lose a loved one in their extended family. And our paid family leave will be uh, six weeks of fully paid leave to care for a critically ill family member. Amazingly, in the United States, only 60% of private sector workers have any paid time off after they lose a loved one, and then it's usually only just a few days. So this is very progressive and obviously very personal to you, Cheryl. Yeah, no, this is personal for me. Um, I lost my husband very suddenly, uh, you know, almost two years ago. Facebook provided leave, I was able to take it, and flexibility, which I needed, and now we're doing even more. And I would say it's not just the leave, that's super important, but it's also support. I mean, I'm sitting on the stage with two dear friends who were amazingly supportive of me, both of you. Um, and you know, my bosses support. And a lot of people here are bosses to a lot of people, but Mark, you know, when you, something happens that's traumatic, it's not just that you have to deal with that, it has ripple effects. Psychologists think of it as secondary losses to the rest of your life. And when I first went back to work, I mean, I felt like I could barely, focus. And so the support Mark provided me was not just take the time you need, I'm here for you, but telling me after I thought I completely messed up a meeting, actually you made a really good point. Or when I felt that people didn't have anything to say to me and I didn't know how to relate, Mark was the one who sat there with me and went through it and said, no, people really want to help, they just don't know what to say, let's think about how, how we, we get through this together. And there are these moments in our life where we all need support, and bereavement is, family illness is certainly one of them. And again, companies need to lead, and I'm proud of what Facebook's done, and I know a lot of other companies here are doing great things, and I hope even more companies join us. Well, thank you for that bold move. Um, I do just want to get off the workplace for one second. Um, I had the honor of reading a book that you have written called Option B um, about losing your husband, about resilience, both personal resilience and resilience in the workplace. Um, can you just give us a little sneak peek about it? Well, I'm grateful you read and Lori read too. Um, so, you know, losing my husband was obvious to say it's devastating is silly. And I know I sit here with many people in this audience having been through real trauma and really challenging things. And so I looked for answers and I looked for answers with you guys, with my friends and with Adam Grant, who's a psychologist. And we looked in the research and we looked in other people's stories of how they faced all forms of resilience from you know, violence to you know, you know, sexual assault to incarceration. And option B is our attempt to share what we learned. And what I learned is that resilience is not something we have a fixed amount of. Resilience is something we build, it's like a muscle. And we build it in ourselves, but we also build it in our friends, and we build it in our communities, and we can build it in our companies. And on a personal level, it's not that you can achieve, I think, greater happiness because you live with these traumas for a long time, but you can go on to grow, to achieve greater meaning, to achieve greater appreciation, and even rediscover joy. When you look at companies, and we looked at companies, we looked at raising resilient children, we looked at building resilient relationships, and we looked at companies as part of the work we did. Companies become resilient, and then they either fail or succeed. Over the long run, a company's performance is tied to resilience. And resilience in companies is really, how do you respond to failure? Do you respond to failure or challenges by everyone hiding their mistakes, or do you respond to failure or challenges by being upfront and being a learning, growing organization? And we've thought for a long time about how we respond to failure, but it's really forced us to do even more thinking and, and even more work about making it safe to fail. Right. Safe to make mistakes and say, hey, I messed that up. Safe to go to a whole, the whole group or the whole company and say, I really got that wrong and I want to do better. And it, every company makes mistakes. I know I make mistakes all day. But no. the, question is, the question is, what do we do then? Right. Do we acknowledge them and learn from them and share those learnings with our colleagues or do we hide them? And we, we build resilience when we share. We build resilience when we are open to sharing those lessons. Well, I think you'll have a lot of readers in the room. What's the publish, publishing date? End of April. End of April, great. Um, okay, we have one last thing. I'm the, I'm the I, they're giving me notes. I'm backstage usually typing, last question, last question, last question. Okay, I'm gonna follow you all. All right, we're gonna do one thing, you have to stand up. Can we, Woody, can you come out here for a second? Okay. That'd be good. So we're gonna do just a little, very quick quiz. Um, it's called Quick Office Etiquette Quiz. 
Oh. Thank you, Woody. This guy is awesome, a maker's man. <laughs> Cheers for Woody. Um, these may look familiar. Um, Amanda McCall, who um, is our amazing oh, yeah, like Makers producer, made me, wants me to say that everything is very sleek at Makers. These are very handcraft. So you're each going to take one, and it's, you'll get the rules. It's like or unlike. Okay, practice, yeah, <laughs> like, unlike. Got it. Okay, here we go. We hadn't seen this before. She said there was something coming. Yeah, this was a surprise. Here we go. Okay, so desk naps. Like naps at your desk. Like, yeah. Yeah, good. Oh, that's thumbs up. I mean, that's I don't like, know. It's I mean, hard to do it Facebook. Because it's kind of open. Okay. Privacy, <laughs> but sure. All right. Loud chewing. Oh, loud chewing and slurping. I'm going to go no. I think I might do that. So I'm going <laughs> to. I, I don't want to. A friend of mine told me the other day that I slurped my coffee. So I'm going to go like. Okay. It's not nice. Unexpected. But I'm being, unexpected answer. Okay. I'm being honest. I gotta stop All right, slurping this one, my I'm hoping I can predict this. Eating large tuna fish sandwiches in small conference rooms. Oh, All no. Right. <laughs> what if you're hungry? Okay. And there's nothing to eat but tuna fish. Okay. Um, no editorializing on all these. It's up <laughs> or down. Okay. Watching adorable puppy videos on full volume without your headphones. Yeah, there we go. Consensus on the puppy videos. Okay. Final question. Blasting Beyonce songs in every women's restroom in the office. Yay! <laughs> New Facebook policy. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Thumbs to you. up to you. <laughs>